Welcome to the Golden Age of Cardboard podcast, where we remember a time when stacks of cards were held together with rubber bands and Mickey Mantles were put in bike spokes. We hope you will enjoy and reminisce as you come along with us as we tell stories about the baseball cards from the Golden Age of Baseball. We will examine the state of the vintage baseball card market and talk to some of the greatest collectors in the hobby. You won't be hearing us talk about any chrome or shiny cards here. Now, to take you on this retrospective journey, here's your host, direct from the shallow end of the gene pool, my son, Mike Moynihan. Yo and hello everybody, Mike here. Welcome to another episode of the Golden Age of Cardboard podcast. Took a week off last week. I needed to spend some time taking care of some things and I hope everybody had a great Memorial Day weekend. I am, before we even go, I'm just going to bring on our guest tonight. We're going to go right into talking. Andy, how are you doing? She blinded me with refractors. What's up, man? I'm doing well. Um, it's crazy that you took a week off. Did you really deserve a week off? I don't know. No, okay. I I totally didn't. But, uh, you know, after traveling cross country with Garrett and then going to the ranch, I was ready to get back to <laughs> doing doing some regular stuff again. I was, uh, I was beat up working at the ranch. You know, there's never... Uh, a dull time at the ranch. There's always stuff to do. I've heard stories. Yeah. Yeah. You know, all too well. And you also know who I'm married to. So nobody outworks Julie, you know, I was about to say, don't even, yeah, don't even act like you do. Oh, I, I so <laughs> don't. She runs circles around me. How was your Memorial day weekend? Ah, uh, it was good. You know, just kind of like, you know, took a few days off, relaxed, kind of recharged the battery. So I'm ready nice. to go now. Always good to do. Uh, I noticed behind you, for those of you on podcast, Andy always has some type of sporting event on behind him. I don't. I see a blank screen behind you. What's going on? I turned it off just for this episode. Like, you know, you never know. Copyright stuff. So I'm like, hey, I'll turn it off. <laughs> you don't want to be distracted. Yeah, I don't. Plus, yeah, plus I'd probably be watching the game and I <laughs> wouldn't be paying attention. So. Uh, this is an interesting time of year. It, my stars are out of the playoffs for hockey, which I have to admit, uh, playoff hockey is pretty intense. It's pretty awesome. And basketball's wrapping up. Who's going to win the title? Well, I would say Denver, but Miami's just been on an incredible run. I mean, if you guys haven't followed, you know, they're an eight seed, uh, barely made the playoffs. They, they won the second play-in game, so they didn't even win the first play-in game they were in. So I think they're only like the second eight seed to ever make the finals, so that's pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Butler's been going pretty nuts in the playoffs, but, you know, this is a baseball podcast. Yeah, so let's uh, stop talking hockey yeah. and basketball and maybe get to something that people are interested in. Exactly. If they haven't tuned out yet uh, – <laughs> Let me tell you what I was thinking about and what's the premise for this episode. And, and you and I can have a good discussion about it because I'm hearing, I, I don't know that it's a wave of people. I don't, I don't know, but I'm hearing people talk about, well, no one's going to care about vintage in 20 years or 10 years, you know, sometime in the future that vintage is going to die and it will only be modern cards that people care about. So that's the overriding theme of this episode. When I say a statement like that, and I hear it usually from young kids, by the way, what immediately comes to your mind? Um, so when you're talking about young kids, and I think that both of us would be the exception to this rule when we were that age, but I think most younger kids, that's probably something that they probably aren't particularly interested in at that present time, but as they get older, learn more about the history of sports, baseball in particular, you know, I think their, their interests change. I mean, our interests still change to this day, right? Uh, totally. It's I'm ever evolving yeah, as I a think, collector. Yeah. 
I mean, I know like both of us were really into baseball history as a kid, but most of the kids that were our age during that time were probably more interested in like the Griffies, the Bonds, the guys of, you know, of that era. And it's probably the same thing that, you know, you're hearing right now with these kids. They're probably more into like Trout, Acuna, Soto, guys like that. But I think they, a lot of them just haven't maybe been exposed to some of this stuff yet. And that's, you know, probably part of our job, I guess, as the older generation of collectors is to, you know, try to teach these kids things. Because one of the things that I've noticed in sports cards lately, I've seen a lot of videos about this where people are talking about, yeah, these young kids, you know, they know their stuff at these shows and everything, right? Now, they do know some stuff, but the stuff that they are more aware of is like prices, uh, comps, you know, stuff like that. A lot of the guys that they're buying the cards of, they don't even really, they've probably never even seen them play, <laughs> which is sad. Right. They do know a lot of stuff, but, you know, maybe they could be taught some of the, the finer points, you know, maybe like, you know, know who the players are and why they're important. And that's true of modern players, you're saying even, not just older guys. That is, yes, it's more so right. true of the older guys. But, yeah, it's even true of the modern players. Like, they, I don't even know that they necessarily watch, you know, a lot of these guys that are playing now. So let's run down a few scenarios. I think it, it'd be good to kind of speculate about this and kind of brainstorm this literally on the fly it, on that. Okay, what would have to happen to make that statement be true that vintage is not collected anymore and unimportant in the hobby in 20 years? What would what scenario plays out or series of events that makes that a reality? Um, well, I guess, you know, all the people that are currently collecting vintage cards now eventually will pass on. And I guess if that love and passion and knowledge of it just dies right there and it's not passed on to the next generation and they have no interest in it, I guess that could possibly be true. Yeah. I'm thinking about how did you and I, you know, learn about the game. Well, we read stories and we read books and we read is my point. And we learned, we didn't have, you know, the technology that exists today to distract us. And so, yes, I found it appealing, but I also didn't have many other choices, I guess, you know, but when I would go to the library, there used to be library, they still have libraries, but you know, you check out a book and I would always gravitate towards, reading a story about Babe Ruth or Willie Mays or somebody and the history of baseball kind of stuff. I never, I didn't want to learn about Abraham Lincoln. I'll, you know, I'm just using another example of Christopher Columbus, or I wanted to learn about the history of baseball because I found it interesting. These kids today are so distracted with other things. I think it could just be that their attentions are just so diluted that they don't spend the time that it takes to learn the things that you and I learned slowly over our childhood. Yeah, I, I can totally agree with that as far as like, we definitely did not have, you know, a lot of the distractions that you see kids have today, much like yourself. I was, I was a history buff, like, um, you know, not just with baseball, but just with everything. Like I just, I loved history and to me, baseball, out of all of the sports, baseball has by far the most fascinating history. And it has so much to do with the, the players and just so many stories that happened to these guys or, you know, back then. And it's just stuff that's just not even like kids today. I don't even know that they would completely understand it if you didn't explain it to them very well, because, you know, so much has changed. Um, you know, technology wise, like these guys were, you know, taking trains to games. And I mean, you know, just stuff that you wouldn't think about today if you were a kid. So, right. yeah, I think it's definitely, definitely up to us to kind of like, you know, expose them to these type of stories and show them that things have not always been the way that they are today, not only in sports, but especially, you know, we're talking about cards here. So, well, would 
will the kids have the attention span to learn from a, even if we wanted to teach them will uh, they have the ability to learn it i mean not all of them will have the attention span or the eagerness or willingness to learn but not all of them did uh, we know people our age when we were kids not everybody wanted to then yeah that's um, true i mean it's, this has always been like you know kind of a niche hobby and yeah you're not gonna like you're not gonna get everybody to want to do this but you don't need everybody to want to do this to keep it relevant it's you know it's it's there's many more people today collecting cards than there were, you know, five, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. The hobby's certainly grown. I think the attention towards vintage has grown, uh, maybe not even commensurate with that, but certainly, you know, to some degree, uh, of, you know, if there's a hundred percent, let's say there's double the people collecting, Certainly not. There's not double the vintage collectors, probably. But who's to know? How do you? I mean, how do you even measure that? I wouldn't even know where to start. But yeah, I think there is. You know, you do see some young guys in the hobby that have an appreciation for vintage and like collecting it and like picking up stuff and know their stuff. Uh, I'm thinking about Ryan from Breakout Cards. You know, he's what 23. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, JT whose hat I'm wearing tonight, Triple Crown 24 sports cards on eBay. If you ever need some cards, go check out JT's store. Um, you know, but those are few and far between. And they also seem like guys that kind of have old souls, you know? yeah. <laughs> Maybe I have an old soul and I just don't realize it, but I don't know. It's this weird, I, I think about that idea and it, it scares me actually. It, it makes me sad if that would turn out to be true in terms of 20 years down the road, vintage being irrelevant in the hobby and not collected. Uh, hopefully I'm around in 20 years, so I'll be at least one. Well, God, I'll be 70. All right. It's a 50, 50 shot that I'm around in 20 years, but uh, that's, I don't think it's higher than that. <laughs> will we still be uh, rooming together at the national in 20 years? That's maybe the better question of the yeah, day. Yeah. Why not? Sure. <laughs> Why not? Absolutely. Um, yeah, like, I just think I, I just find and I think many, many younger people, if they just get exposed to some of these stories about the cards, because the, the fascinating thing about vintage cards is there's still to this day a lot of unknowns. And there's new things being discovered about it all the time. Um, yeah. You know, there's still certain sets that we don't even know how they were distributed, where they were distributed, stuff like that. And I think that's one of the one of the things that really piques my interest when it comes to like vintage is because in today's world, you know, we have all the technology, we have all this information. So, I mean, like, you know, everything about a set before it comes out. You know what I mean? Checklists are released. Yeah, release day. Yeah, it's, just, it's fascinating that there's there's cards out there that are a hundred years old that we still don't know to this day. How did how are these distributed? Like you know and stuff like that. It's there's there's new cards still being discovered. Like there's still not even completed checklists on certain sets. So I mean there's there's this great mystery not only to the players but the cards as well. And yeah, I think it you know. The kids are not like I think a lot of times we get uh, we get um, a little upset at these kids a little bit too easy because we just expect them to know stuff that they shouldn't really know <laughs> until we teach and, them. Right. They have to be taught and, you know, they have to be willing in that as well. Like you can't just you can't force them to love this stuff or like it. You know, it's just if they have an interest in it, though, I do feel like we have some responsibility to you know, try to teach them what little we know. Okay. Sounds like a Whitney Houston song. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Is that, is that what I was, I may have been quoting Whitney Houston. I'm not, <laughs> you might have channeled some Whitney Houston there. Yeah, probably. Okay. So if we have this responsibility to some degree, um, I hope, you know, doing things like this, if you can get a kid to listen to a, you know, long form podcast, uh, maybe they'll catch on to something, but 
but I find the most of the people that watch this channel or listen to this show are, you know, they're older, not older adults, but you know, they're at least, you know, in their thirties and forties, fifties, sixties and beyond. So it, it, it does seem like, and, I, but I think that's okay. 20 years from now, these 20 somethings that are in the hobby now will be in their forties. And I think they will, as I've described many times, go through that maturation process as process as a collector and go, okay, I've collected all the new shiny stuff. What, what's different? I love collecting. What else can I discover out there? And then you start going down the vintage rabbit hole, as we both know, and you get sucked in uh, and you just, that becomes, well, this, because it's not, it, it is rare stuff. It is scarcer stuff. You know, golden age vintage stuff is not really scarce. It's the, the tops, Bowman's, you know, those are all pretty readily available, but they're still not like, you know, anything printed today. They're yeah. still way more rare than that. Right. Your yeah. Common base card in 2023. And I think that the kids today that are in the hobby, they have a willingness to learn, but it kind of boils back to what are they being taught? Because, yeah. yes, and I feel like a lot of the content that's put out today that kids watch is focused on how to run a business in cards. It's not like no one's really teaching kids how to collect baseball cards. They're teaching them how to make money off of them. They're teaching them how to run a business. And you, you hear this a lot about, you know, why this is like people will even make the point, oh, this is such a great hobby for kids because it teaches them how to how to run a business. I'm like, that may be fine and well, but is anyone teaching these kids how to collect cards and how fun it can be and how interesting it can be outside of the money aspect? Because it doesn't have to be all about money, even though that seems to be what is being pushed at kids. Yeah, that's the driving force for them. I I do get quite a few uh, direct messages through Instagram, which, by the way, mine is uh, Baseball Collector Mike. Andy, what's your Instagram? People want to ask you a question, by the way. She blinded me with refractors. Boy, that's the greatest name ever, as I've said hundreds of times. But on Instagram, I'll get direct messages from people. Hey, I'm just diving into vintage or I've listened to your podcast and it really got me excited about vintage. So that's how it does happen. It's not like it's, it's not happening. Oh, I was into this, but now I really like vintage because of X, Y, Z reasons, numbers of reasons. Uh, and there, a lot of the questions are, how do I even start with this? <laughs> you know, it's uh, such a big world and it can be intimidating. I get that, you know, starting in vintage and just dive in. Nobody wants to get duped or fooled or taken advantage of or whatever. Right. But the reality is there's a in vintage, especially there's a learning curve and it's not always straight up. You know, so you're going to make mistakes. You're going to, I made a perfect, I made a gaff the other day on uh chasing cardboard when I called a T207, a T204. In fact, I screwed it up twice. I said, <laughs> uh, I called it a T205 and then a T204 and I, I knew it was a T207. Yeah. But in the moment, I was like, oh. so it's not like you, it, my point of that is you're always learning. And that's actually the, as you said, they're discovering new things and finding all these cool nuances about these old sets. The learning part of it is actually thrilling. The fact that, you know, you're not going to ever know it all. Um, yeah. And that's so true. That. That's so true because I mean, even even the people that I would consider the most knowledgeable vintage card people in the world will openly admit there are so many things that they don't know anything about in cards. And yeah. that's, to me, that's what's great about it. There is not, there is not one single person you can go to that could answer every single question that you have. So you have, yeah. that's, that's the importance of like, you know, for kids branching out, finding different YouTube channels and not just the ones that have been pushed down your throat, 
But like, if you want to learn about a particular set, hey, just go into YouTube and type in that particular set, see what comes up. Maybe there's somebody out there that's done a video on it. Like, and it, maybe it was 10 years ago. Maybe it doesn't have the best lighting, the best production, but the information is the important part. And I think that gets lost in a lot of, you know, today's sports card content is the information. <laughs> yeah. And that it, it's funny how it, it kind of takes a village. Like if you want to learn, we know you and I, you know, guys that are experts in certain sets and certain eras maybe, or whatever. And we rely on them all the time to help us uh, answer questions that we have like, man, what is this? Or who did this? And no one person can know everything, but collectively we know a lot as a, as a group of vintage collectors out there. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. Like if you're looking at a certain card from a certain set, yeah, there's probably somebody that you know that knows more about it than you. Right. So that's, that's the kind of people, you know, that we, that you want to talk to. You don't, you don't want to like talk to somebody that has like a hundred thousand subscribers that doesn't know anything about it and ask them, Hey, what do you think about this? Right. Like, why would you care what they think about it? They don't know anything about it. Yeah. There's a, a mountain of knowledge out there. You got to be willing to hunt for it. You got to be willing to look for it, whether it's on forums or YouTube or whatever your learning method of choice is it's out there. And yeah you know, people want, it's, it's funny. Also the vintage guys, they, it feels like they want to share that knowledge, you know? Um, they, I, I certainly do. You do. We like what, what little we do know, you know, and you said something earlier, I think it's so critical for any vintage collector to understand is that when you finally get to the point that you realize you don't know everything, that's when you're ready to start learning. <laughs> because if you think, you know, it all, first of all, you're wrong. And cause you don't, nobody can, and right. it's not a knock on you. You may have a, a insane amount of knowledge, but even I'm thinking of guys in my head right now that I know have significantly greater knowledge about vintage than I do. And uh, I bring them on the show because <laughs> that's the whole point is I like to learn too. And yeah. if I'm talking about a, a, a set or a era or whatever, a player that they are, that they've spent a tremendous amount of time learning about, great you know um they, they got to know they don't know it all i guess is you got to go yep i don't know it all i'm gonna go learn yeah and this this is especially true at the national because you know a lot of our a lot of our good friends that'll be at the national are you know big time vintage collectors they have a ton of knowledge about vintage and what i like to do when I'm around those guys more so than when I'm around probably any other people is I like to talk less and listen more because they've got such great knowledge and what a great opportunity to soak up some of that knowledge. Yeah. That's one of the funnest things about it. I, I think an indication of the vintage strength in the hobby is when you go to the national or you go to these big shows and you, you look around and how much vintage is out there now granted most other shows besides the national or strongsville are pretty modern you know i would say certainly more than 50 percent modern ultra modern kind of stuff but it's dying when people stop selling vintage and that's just not happening anytime soon i don't i can't imagine no i don't think so um and I think maybe maybe one of the things that's somewhat intimidating for not just younger people, but just anyone that wants to get into vintage is there there is like uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? There's just I, I, I'm not going to say I wouldn't say hostility, but there's just like there's a lot of. Uh, they did like these two it's like these two groups of people like you have the vintage and the modern people and the modern people a lot of them think oh those guys are just you know old and all this and then the vintage guys oh those guys are just buying this new stuff they don't know what they're doing and there's just like a lot <laughs> there's a lot of that that goes on so there it would probably be helpful if there was just more um positive interaction between the groups 
So maybe just some unspoken tension that's like there. Yeah, that, or, that's a great way to put it. Unspoken tension. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes spoken tension. <laughs> sometimes spoken tension. True. But only to your fellow group of. But again, I don't think the vintage world is unwelcoming to new guys wanting to learn. Uh, it's actually exciting when I get those messages and people are diving. I'm like, great. And they're like, what should I collect? I'm like, uh, whatever you like. Like, what, you know, uh, what, what era means a lot to you? What do you, you know, go learn? And there's so many resources out there. Do you think it's harder? Like, do you think people continue to move backwards? Maybe like if you dive into vintage, do you maybe start in the sixties and seventies or the fifties or something? And then, then you kind of get like, I'm getting the pre-war bug pretty bad. And I'm, I'm really so good for so long about not just diving headfirst into pre-war because it's a Pandora's box. I am so petrified to open, not because I don't want to learn about it, because of the money that I might end up spending on all the great cards that are pre-war. Uh, I don't know. What do you think? Do they, do they kind of move through the timeline or? Um, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say necessarily that's the case, but I can, I can see where that, that could happen sometimes, but uh, yeah, like to me, the, the pre-war baseball stuff is to me the most fascinating type of cards that there are in any sport. And um, it's because that that time period was just so unique. It was filled with so many wild colorful. characters. A lot of character, a lot of colorful characters. Yeah, very experience. very colorful characters, and just a lot of um, <laughs> just the way that the cards were put out. Like you know, like there was candy companies making cards, cigarette companies, all these different places that the cards came from. Um, so it's just, it's really fascinating. Like it, it takes a long time to just properly identify some of these cards because, you know, in today's, in today's world, you can look at a Topps Chrome card and it's going to say on the back what year it is, right? These cards, like, you know, you have to know what they are. Like you can't just like, you can't just look on the back and it's necessarily going to tell you what it is. Right. But you have to, you have to do some research and some, some hunting and that, that goes all the way, you know, up into the forties, fifties, sixties, different, you know, different types of regional sets and stuff like that. So it's, to me, I love doing the research. Uh, so it's, it's a ton of fun to do that. Yeah. There's, this is called the golden age of pod of cardboard podcast for a reason. Cause that's the era when I said I wanted to do a vintage podcast. Okay. I have at least some working post-war through 1980. That's what I want to do a podcast about. Cause you, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't completely speaking out of my butt all the time or, and pre-war definitely intimidates me from a knowledge standpoint, because there is so much, like you just said of the different things and, you know, yeah, I screw up every once in a while identifying a card, but it doesn't, it's certainly never intentional or I want to, I want to be learning what's going on. And, um, well, like on the, on the card you were talking about earlier, you knew what the card was. You just misspoke. In right. The moment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have one, like yeah, I have, I have a speaker from the T207. Yeah. That wasn't the first time you had seen one of those cards. <laughs> <laughs> it was not. Uh, and that's not even a point, uh, other than you also can't be afraid to make mistakes. And, you know, that's, that's true of any collecting, like any era, any cards. Uh, we, it's like, we want to be right all the time and you just can't. And so you, if you kind of just acquiesce to the fact that you're going to make a mistake every once in a while, it's okay. Uh, learn from it. My dad always says it's not a mistake if you learn from it. Well, so, and, and kind of to your, your point earlier, uh, like the, 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 debate between like certain years of cards still goes on back then you know you have like the 48 49 leaf thing you have you know t206s were distributed over several different years like the cards now you know what they are you know when they came out you know how they were distributed it's just it's fascinating that some of that stuff is still kind of like people still argue over it yeah so 
there's a lot of debate that goes on with vintage cards and I like that. I like debates. Well, what makes you let's let's think about again why vintage would be dead in 20 years. Well, these they never watched them play. And I, I think about the fact that this has been happening this way. People have been saying vintage wasn't going to be important for decades and decades because, well, why do people still collect Tito sixes? Nobody alive saw them play, right? And yet it's one of the most popular sets in the vintage world to collect. Why are people gravitate towards it? Well, it's the beauty of the cards. It's the player's story. It's all the things you mentioned in person to care about that stuff, right? Yeah. And that's going to be true forever. That's not going to stop. That idea that Mickey Mantle, and I'm just using him because he's the biggest guy in the, the golden era, you know, Mantle, Aaron Mays, even guys like Don Mossy with the weird eyebrow, you know, there, there's just, there's always going to be a demand for that. I can't see that statement of vintage being gone or not collected or irrelevant in 20 years ever coming true. It makes no sense to me. No, I mean, cause like, if you think of the, like you mentioned the T206s, like, so those are wildly collected right now. Right. Right. And that set is what? 114 years old. Right. Nobody alive now that that's seen any of those people play. I mean, right. and look at, I mean, it's still widely collected right now. I mean, you could argue that's one of the, probably one of the most popular sets of all time still to this day. I mean, like it's still probably collected more so than any other set. Yeah. And you know, 114 <laughs> years ago. So, I mean, I think we'll and be good for at least another 20. <laughs> it's funny how the, the value is, aren't the reason people collect them. If you talk to people that collect that set, it's not because of the money. Oh man, this set's going to be worth a lot of money down the road. That's not the motivation. That's not the driver. Uh, I recently picked up a T206 uh, Cy Young and I didn't buy it because of the money or anything. I just, I've always wanted that card. It's the it's part of a, a set registry that I've been doing for a really long time. And I've all, I never have owned a Cy Young playing days card. And so there were just, I can list multiple reasons why that card was appealing to me as a collector. Um, but I think that'll always be true. There will always be other reasons besides money. I hope anyway, down the road that people want to collect this stuff. Yeah. I mean, I'm totally on board with what you're saying as far as like, there 100% needs to be other reasons that people are doing this besides money because these cards go up, they go, they go down. Like, you know, we, no one really knows like in 10, 15, 20 years, what cards are going to be more valuable then than they are today. But what I will say, and I think this is one of, if somebody is worried about value, the reason that a lot of vintage cards are worth money today is because they weren't supposed to be. And in today's card world, you are being told that you should buy these cards because they are going to be valuable later on. So right. that's two completely different things. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's all about motivation, right? It's all about you know, shoot parents threw them away, right? Like, Oh, the John, little Johnny doesn't need his baseball cards anymore. He's off in college, you know, in, in the late sixties or whatever. Let's, let's just pitch the. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's, you know, that's why some of these cards, there, there are a lot of cards that, you know, you, that might be considered scarce, but they weren't necessarily supposed to be. Right. It's just that they got, like you said, they got tossed, you know? So it was, it was more of a natural flow to it than some of the stuff from today that is being produced to be scarce. And I don't know, like it just seems, yeah, that just seems like a, a inter interesting little nugget there. Could just pile up, you know, 
everybody donate their 2023 tops boxes that they're opening and we'll go put them in the East river or something like they did. Now that is a, that is a fascinating story. And there, you know, see, that's another one of those things too. It's like, it's like this piece of history and there's, you know, conflicting arguments like, Oh, this happened or it didn't happen. Like right. still, you know, and that's, that's the great thing. Like there, I think for, for stuff to me to be interesting, there needs to be a little bit of mystery to it. Like, I think that's one of the things that is the most fascinating about these cards is you don't know everything and you probably never will because no one knows. <laughs> there was a moment you and I had at the Burbank show when we went last, was it September last year? Um, yeah, I think it was September. Or was it this year we went? Uh, and now you I don't know. Now Whenever we went to the Burbank show, it was this year. Was it I this think. year? Yeah, it had to be. I'm terrible with time. I am too. Okay, we went to the Burbank. We show. went to the show. <laughs> and you, for people that don't know, Andy is, I'll use the word selective on what he adds to his collection. It's got to really hit a nerve in his collecting brain that fires off the right, you know, synapses to get him to be excited about a card and i saw you get excited about a card and i was kind of with you through the whole process and that's the uh, um what year was that card made it was 1958 it was the hires root beer the test no, the strip card oh the strip card that's what card i'm talking about that one let's see what the was speaker right yeah 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 I'm trying to think. I, I couldn't tell you what year that was, to be honest, right now. I but know, let's see. to see you get genuinely like, wow, I've never seen that before. I've never seen that image. You know, both you and I aren't huge strip card fans just because of the cartoonish look that most of them have. But this one had a really cool photo or, or drawing or whatever. Yeah. Um, and you were drawn to it. What What strings did that pluck for you and your – in your in your mind well i mean just having read a lot of stories like both as a kid and as adult about tris speaker um probably one of the more underrated players in the history of baseball yeah I mean, he was known as one of the best defensive center fielders uh he hit for like a crazy high average and like you said the image of the card itself was what drew me to the card and you know, I'd never seen that card before. And most strip cards that I've looked at, like I've seen a lot of like what I would consider kind of goofy looking strip cards, you know, like ones where it'll say it's somebody, but it doesn't look like them at all. They might be throwing it with the wrong hand or hitting the wrong, you know, stuff like that. So this one, I'm just, I just saw that and I was like that just, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't an expensive card. I think it, what did I end up paying for that? Like $150 or something? Yeah, something. Like it, wasn't, it wasn't anything crazy, but it was just a cool looking baseball card from like a cool time period. And I didn't have a true speaker card. So I was like, Hey, this is, this is pretty cool. Let's get this. Yeah. And so it's just this like, wow, you know, moment that we have with vintage. I've had it many, many times in my collecting life where I didn't even know I, wow, I really want that card. Um, any more things we want to talk about with this before we head out of here? It's your show, man. <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> well, I would love to hear comments down below about y'all's thoughts on the future of vintage. What is it? Is it bright? Is it fading? Is it going to die someday? I, I simply can't see it, but I can, I'd love to hear arguments for or against what I'm thinking, I think Andy's agreeing that we he doesn't see it happening that way either. No, it's it's definitely not going to die. I mean, there's just <laughs> there's always going to be people that want to collect this stuff. Yeah, people were probably thinking it was going to die like when we were kids. You know, people were probably like, "Oh, these kids today, you know, they only care about bonds and <laughs> wire." Like and, yeah. yeah, they're never going to want to collect these old guys. But I'm yeah, we do. <laughs> Jose Canseco, Don Mattingly, I'm just remembering. Daryl Strawberry. 
great players of my childhood that I loved and I loved collecting them, but I, I kind of grew out of it. If that makes any sense. I, I got older and wiser, I guess. Yeah. Definitely older. Maybe not. Definitely, wiser. definitely older. I mean, we're both definitely older, wiser. I mean, there's debate. There could be a good debate on that. But. <laughs> well, man, uh, I, again, everybody out there would love to hear what you think. Like, this is something I've heard more than once, which is why I wanted to do an episode on it. And who better to talk with about it than my good friend, Andy. So Andy, thanks for being on the show for the 148th time or whatever it's been. Yep. Appreciate uh, it. Is the check in the mail? It, it is. I mailed it uh, yesterday. I don't know that I put a stamp on it though. So that okay. may not. I was about to say, I didn't get my last check. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, my friend. And uh, everybody out there. Hey, Collect what you love and would love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. We'll talk to you soon. Keep collecting.